Okay. We cool? Uh, yeah, I hope so. Rock and roll. <laughs> oh, this is live TV, man. What could be more fun than this? You ready? Oh, my God. Okay. Hey, everyone. This is Georgia from Tippy.com. It's September 11th, 2011, and this is iPad Live. iPad Live is brought to you by the Tippy iPad Accessory Store, your one-stop shop for chargers, cases, cables, and much, much more. For all your iPad needs, go over to store.tippy.com. See you there. Whew, we did it. <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay. New audio, new video things. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. We're joining like us tonight. Minutes late. Come on. <laughs> it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Uh, joining us tonight is the co-host of Mobile Design Podcast Iterate, the CIO of Nickelfish, Seth Clifford. Was that hey, too Georgia, loud, Seth? How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm glad we can hear you now. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too, completely. Took a while, but uh, yeah, we got there in the yeah. end. So, so for anybody listening later, you missed all the fun of the live show where all of our beta equipment decided to not work all at the same time. That was uh, absolutely delightful. Joining us also is my co-host from iPhone Live, iPad Live, Sen and Tech TV, 100,000 other podcasts, and the managing editor of Tippy.com, Renee Ritchie. How's it going, Georgia? It's yeah. I'm, I might be. I might need to do a few breathing techniques. A few breathing techniques? Only a few? Just a few. <laughs> I've I've been breathing nonstop since about four o'clock this morning. I'm about to get lightheaded. That that might be a good thing. That might be a good thing. Uh, this this video stuff is interesting, man. I like the video a lot, actually. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, do we have a show to do as well, though, or is this just is yeah? No, video let's. Test? Yeah, no, let's let's go through everything we got because there's also a really big show going. So we had iPhone Live 169, AT&T Mono. Well, there were some things that happened with the government getting upset about big businesses eating up other big businesses. And, well, I mean, you really should just go and download it and listen to it because it was pretty extensive discussion. Yeah, do that now. No, 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 not now. You're listening no, to the not show now. now. Wait till after the show. <laughs> Then before you listen to anything from any other network, go listen to that. Please stick around. And we also had Super Functional 10 Core Fitness. What was this about, Renee? Um, that was about, you know, the, the fad of core fitness, you know, uh, Pilates, yoga. Maybe it's not a fad. It's been around for 20 years. But Jeff kind of goes over what the good points and bad points are and what you should look for in some when you're trying to train on core fitness. Great. So something really important. Yeah, Take a look. absolutely. Check it out now. Yeah, it was a good one. I enjoyed that. Did you like, yeah, Seth actually gave us a subject matter for the previous show, which is uh, functional sleeping, and uh, Jeff did a whole show on it. Yeah, I finally got through my queue and listened to it, and uh, it was great. It was great. It was really helpful. I mean, thankfully, uh, the stuff that I was curious about are not the serious things that he was describing. I don't have the kind of pain that he was... Uh, talking about so I felt a lot better after hearing that I'm just uh, getting old and stiff so that's really all I'm attributing it to it's not really uh, terrible (laughs) we have iPad 3 news tons and tons of iPad 3 news well a little bit so I wrote up an editorial on you know pretty much the iPad transition product line and we've discussed this before right Renee yes whether or not there will be a uh, cheapy version of the iPad to kind of uh, continue, which Apple does with the iPhone and the iPod. So it would make a lot of sense. You know, it, it, it's interesting because they've never done that. They, they did it once for the iPod Touch. They kept the iPod Touch 2 when they introduced the iPod Touch 3. Uh, but that's the only time they've done it. Other than that, they've always upgraded it and just made a low-capacity version. But the i and the iPhone, you know, the last two or three years they had the iPod, iPhone 3G, then the iPhone 3GS. Now is the low-cost iPhone. But 
We kind of hoped that, or thought that they might keep the original iPad around as a low-cost iPad, and they didn't. Yeah, I'm a little bit shocked that they wouldn't because it makes – then again, they're, you know, they were – way ahead of the curve. There was no real competition at the time for it. So maybe now would be more of a push to have something that would be a cheap um, alternative for people that would want to buy something. But again, tablets are so expensive to make. There isn't really a, well, there wasn't really a exceptionally cheap, popular version of a tablet, but maybe with um, the Kindle tablet that might come out, I don't know, that might be enough to uh, have Apple want to put up a competition to that. I don't know because the other thing we we talked about was sort of whether they would do like because the, the Amazon one is seven seven inches is that right and uh, yeah. we don't know yet they haven't announced it but the rumor is it's seven inches and uh, Steve Jobs has made bitter mocking fun of that saying you'd have to shave your fingers to use it and you can't possibly differentiate apps at a seven inch size um, but you know he said there'd be no video on an iPod too right yeah true but. Um, for them to make a seven inch iPad would be really expensive for them. Like they already are making the iPad too, so it wouldn't be horribly expensive for them to remodel, redesign, and have to deal with and just keeping the iPad already there. Well, that's the thing is that, and they make so much money by having such a simple product line that it's hard. Like there was a rumor, it wasn't even a rumor. Like there was some conjecture that maybe they'd go bigger. I don't even know if it was conjecture. Maybe it was just like Seth, like fanboys graphic artists and photographers wanting a 12-inch iPad? Yeah, there was, I, I remember hearing that kind of going around back when we initially had those rumors that there was going to be another release this fall. And I don't know, I thought about it and I looked at the current iPad size and I thought about, well, what would it mean to have a bigger one? And for the stuff that I use it for, uh, I don't think I'd really want a much bigger screen. I think that there's definitely a use case for a bigger screen. And I think there are people that have really adopted the iPad and and gone with you know and and you know changed a lot of their workflow to incorporate it and they would really like some extra screen real estate and could probably do a lot more with it. People like artists and photographers that may actually need you know a few more pixels and an inch or two more to get more accomplished. But it's gonna it's kind of a hard sell, I guess, because so many people uh, bought the iPad in its current size that. It's almost like, well, why why would you want to introduce another larger one or another smaller one? Even though there's people that say, oh, 7 inches would be great or 12 inches would be great. I mean, that's kind of what Apple does. They figure out the thing that most people want and then that's what they make. Which is not to say it won't happen, but I, I, it's it's kind of tough. It's it's really, I think, more of an edge case for pros. And, of course, that was the, the rumor that it would be an iPad Pro uh, with a bigger screen, higher resolution, you know, and... and the rest of that stuff. The amount of money that they would have to spend in uh, developing and, and getting a, a full product line to develop something, when you already have a 10-inch iPad that's in you know development, they've already bought it, they know how much it costs in order to deal with it, doesn't make as much sense for me for, say, like increasing it to 12 inches or to decrease it to 7. And it's not like the competition is breathing down their neck and they have to actually worry about what's going to happen with that. They're already at the head of the pack. They um, already know what they're doing. So, yeah, it would be great. I think it would be a smart idea for them to just put out, leave the iPad 2 there, uh, make it a little bit cheaper when the iPad 3 comes out. But um, I don't think that they would actually be going out and changing things now just because they don't really have to later. I do think that it would be neat at one stage of time to have like a large um, tablet device, like, you know, like I'll even say table size, something like that, that you could actually do a lot of your work on and, and it could just kind of copy everything that you're doing. Something like, uh, was that one of the Microsoft, uh, you know, I don't know, thought lines, one of the vaporware <laughs> yeah, the things surface. that they dealt with. Yeah. That would yeah. be kind of cool. But, you know, besides that, I don't see that, that any of that's going to happen anytime soon just because I don't think that they need to. You know what's funny is that you said that it's not like other tablet companies are breathing down their neck. Uh, I would suggest they're not even breathing in their neighborhood, city, <laughs> maybe state area. I mean, I just, um, I, I don't think they're... You think Amazon might force them to react? I don't see Apple as being particularly panicky. I don't think that they would necessarily force them to react to anything at this point. No. No, 
I don't think that they're they're really frightened. That being said, we also discussed how much Apple uh, has done to keep the iPad from leaking out the the amount of actual um, care that they take to keep all of the products that they're working on secret. Uh, that being said, it's still kind of juxtaposed to the iPhones that they keep on just leaving at bars. <laughs> um, Maybe an iPad <laughs> is too big to leave in the bar, especially in those security cases. Crunch, ask me iPod, it's in the case, don't touch it. And then like he right. gets up to leave and it's chained around his neck. Ah, oh, oh, what is that? Cut it off. Right. Having them, uh, you know, people always travel with the, the iPad when it was uh, deciding to come out. How uh, I, I found it really interesting how they actually, well, it was said, rumored that they actually take a picture of the wood grain of the table of which the iPad was being placed on. Now, the iPad wasn't, well, so, you well, could be, actually see the screen. Off. They drilled a hole in your desk, put a bicycle lock through it, connected it to a case that covered everything about the iPad except for the screen, so you couldn't even see what it looked like. You couldn't like. tell the shape of it, right. And yeah. then photographed the grain of the desk so that if any pictures leaked out, they could use some sort of artificial intelligence to do wood grain matching and secretly the fry you over the internet? Don't, don't, people, don't people hear about Photoshop? I'm just saying I would have just, you know, just cut and pasted that baby up, but... Not in a bar. But it did leak, it, right? But I mean, it Gadget had the shot the night before. Well, the night before is one thing, but, you know, having an iPhone leaking out, you know, a month beforehand and th three or four weeks before, it, it's a lot of, t it's a big difference between that. At least they spent the time to try to, they, you do the best that you can and then you end up, in the end, it's always user error, right? Is that why we haven't seen an iPad 3 yet, Seth? Yeah, sure. That's, <laughs> that's why. I think that uh, there's probably there's probably a way to go before we see an iPad three. I'm not really holding my breath for it. I, I just uh, we've said it before. The phone is more important to me. It's the thing that I absolutely rely on. It's my lifeline. I, I'm chomping at the bit now. It's getting closer and closer, and I just really I'm feeling like I need the upgrade. I'm not even thinking about iPad yet. Yeah, you what? You call well, it? of course, I'm thinking about it. Well, he just got the iPad. He didn't even get it yet. No, really? Didn't? Oh, his work got one. Yeah, I still have my first gen one. You gonna tease me now, Georgia? I'm not. I'm not. No, I actually, I have to say, the first generation iPad is quite comparable. I don't, you know, if I'm, if I'm, you know, I like the actual feel of the iPad two more than the iPad one. I like the curved kind of soft feminine form factor. But besides that, it doesn't actually, you know, the speed, the differences between it, though there are. You know, yeah, you, you can you can edit out where I said I was it. waiting for the third one to make a big jump. But if you know if someone had if a developer or you know a tester at Apple did have a third gen iPad that was in a case, and someone were to sneak a peek at that, and all they could tell was that the screen was higher def. I mean, it wouldn't really mean much anyway, right? No, but yeah. that's the other that's the other reason why I didn't get the iPad too because I thought eh, the screen's going to look the same fundamentally if it's a little quicker. I, I don't really care if it was a Retina display. I would not have hesitated at all, even if it was a thousand dollars. I would have found a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would have bumped up his uh, his show fee, Georgia. Yeah, no, yeah, I can get that. My currently very affordable show fee. Uh, all right, what else is happening? I'm losing track. Well, we have a lot of cloud news. Do we? iTunes Match Beta is open again to developers. Now, again, this is not something that you should, you know, back up all of your data if you're kind of messing around with this. And people have not had really happy results with that. You know, just having all of my music kind of deleted off of my um, devices would, would freak me out. But it's beta. They tell you that up front. They tell you they're going to wipe your data when the beta is over. You're just there. The thing that kills me is that you have to pay twenty nine. You have to pay your twenty nine twenty four dollars. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, twenty five dollar um, subscription fee during the beta when they tell you they'll be deleting your music. Yeah. Yeah, and you're helping them out. Yeah, and paying for the privilege. But Apple's always like they charge the early access fee. For, they call it a developer fee, right, for iOS, but it's really an early access fee. Uh, and they charge, you know, to be part of their subscription beta. It's it's a good little business if you can get into it. We're not charging anything for our video beta, and maybe that's our maybe that's the big mistake we make. That's why we're, oh. we don't have seventy two billion in the bank. After this 
evening's performance, I'm sure we'd be issuing some refunds. <laughs> no, nothing happened, Seth. Remember, this is, this is being recorded and it will be fixed in post, so no one knows what you're talking about right now. That's true. I, I'm speaking out of turn. Yeah. Crazy. That's true. That's true. So, yeah, let us know. Let us know exactly um, if you've tried it out, what you think about it. Do it. And, Renee, do you have anything to say about uh, the iTunes 10.5 beta well, before 8? We, before we move on, I, we did manage to oh. try the iTunes match, and it, do, it did seem to work pretty well. I mean, it does a quick scan. It delivers all the music that you have available already, which is the same thing that um, the iTunes, I forget what it's called, music, the same thing that the music, the re-download service. And then it's, it scans your hard drive and makes available to you any of the music it finds on your hard drive that's in the iTunes catalog at 256-bit ACC. But if you have, like, you know, the Robotech soundtrack, for example, uh, it may not find that. Or, um, you know, uh, it's, it's certain things like, like certain, you know, African music or something, it's not going to find that. So then it'll upload those in whatever quality you have it in. It can't magically make it better quality. Um, which is a complete, which is an interesting approach because it, it, it's a music locker, but it's only, down, it's only uploading what it has to. Renee, delay before you play. What does that mean? Is what is there, <laughs> is there a noticeable de- delay in play time, and how long does it usually take for an upload? Um, it depends on your internet speed connection, but it's fairly it's fairly snappy, and it, it's like it, it's like a stream. It's a stream that ends up being a download. So, I mean, in our instant gratification world, it's not the same as a local file, but it's about the same as hitting any stream and starting that playing, and then it just keeps downloading in the background. And the next time it is a local file. So are we talking three seconds, ten seconds? I don't know. I didn't measure. And it'll depend on your um, on the speed of your connection. If you're if you have a really fast internet connection, it'll go faster. But you know, iTunes and I don't know if you noticed this, Seth, but iTunes never seems to peg your internet connection. If you have ten whatever, ten ten megabits down, it'll only use like three or four. It never uses the full pipe. I feel like a long time ago there was some kind of setting in there too. Uh, it's probably gone now, but I. I I distinctly remember seeing something about allowing a certain amount of bandwidth through iTunes, like maybe three or four versions ago, and I guess that's that's just not in there anymore. But it's probably because, like with everything else, they want to optimize the experience, so they've basically kind of targeted a certain you know bandwidth space where they'd like to you know like to like to have everything, and I guess that's. That's where they want it to sit, and if it's you know a little more, a little less, it's okay. But I guess it's just to provide the best experience to the most people most of the time. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, George. I'm sorry I interrupted you. You were going to ask something about the new betas. Yeah, have you tried? What do you think about the new betas? What are people uh, going at it again? You know, I'm still stuck on my old. Well, this isn't an iOS beta. This is the first time they released just iTunes and just iWork for iOS. I, they didn't release the, any software. Yeah, I don't update anything. No, but well, I mean, like this, that you wouldn't update anything. This is you, the only reason you'd use this version of iTunes is to use the iTunes Match beta and pay the thirty bucks or twenty-five bucks. And a lot of people had trouble paying it. By the way, it was kind of random whether they took your money or not, which is odd. Um, and the iWork. So for some, sorry, Renee, wait. Yeah. So some people got it. They did not charge. No, some people just couldn't get it. They kept saying, take okay. my money, and it would just say not available, not available. Not a, and then right. randomly, for some people, like um, Mark Gurman from 9to5Mac uh, offered a prize to anyone, to the first guy who could get on, and I pressed the button and it worked. So I got, I snagged us four air horn promo codes for Tippy. Yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that sound in arguments with people. Like, they would be, <laughs> they would just be yelling, and I would just go, yeah and make the noise and they would just stop and look at me and then start yelling again and I would just keep making it and eventually they were just like you're out of your mind and they would walk away and I declared it a victory oh sudden victory <laughs> nice uh, yeah so uh, the iWork stuff also they, they say they'll randomly delete your stuff so it's not like it's it's you're beta testing it but you're you're depending on your documents being there and then they're going to randomly delete them so I, I haven't tried that yet yeah, I don't like the randomly deleting things of, of anything. So, And another tip that iCloud is really getting close to being ready to be released, they tell developers to get their apps ready for the iCloud backup and restore, which is so very cool, like the idea of having everything backed up. Um, yeah, so get their stuff ready. Yeah. iCloud is coming. 
Is that a big deal, you think, Seth? Is like, do, you think developers are going to hesitate to put that in, or, or is that just a no-brain feature that everyone should support, which is kind of my belief? I think it's probably going to be the developers that are really, really in tune with what's going on with the App Store and with Apple, you know, people like Icon Factory and, and you know, companies like that that make really high-quality apps are way out in front of it, you know, and then I think it's probably going to be a, a large middle section of people that slowly kind of implement it over the course of the, the weeks of the first month and it, you know, rolls out in updates. And then, of course, there'll be the holdouts. I mean, there's still apps in the store right now that don't even have retina graphics. What? So, yeah, Has Mark I Edwards know. been informed? Uh, informed? Are you kidding me? He's got his pitchforks and torches ready. Does it actually pay to have your application, like, you know, to if people are buying your application, does it actually pay to keep your app as um, cutting edge as possible? You mean because Apple doesn't let you charge for upgrades? No, exactly. So, so you know, you're no going to spend all of this extra time and effort for, you know, something that people have already gotten used to not having. But it's it's the I new would... sale. It's the new sales. Pe- I think that they're, you know, they've already got those people and they kind of want the next the next set of buyers and maybe the next set of buyers will look at whether they have restore and backup before they buy. Right. But we're not used to that yet. You see, until when we, when we get actually used to restore and backup, which I think is going to be a huge thing, but until we actually get used to it, um, and some games, you know, it's only so important to that. Yeah, I don't know how many people will be like, you know, jumping on the bad wagon to be the, the newest and uh, grievous because it is a lot of time and effort in certain applications. I'm sure it would be quite complex in order to get fully updated to it. I think it's like what Seth said, Or would said, it be though? a simple thing, Seth? Well, I don't know. I actually haven't looked at the APIs involved, so I really would not be able to give you an accurate answer as to how difficult it is. But I would imagine that Apple tries to make these things not difficult, and then I guess the the subtext would be hopefully it's not difficult depending on how you've coded your app. So if you've coded your app in such a way that precludes you from doing that in an easy way, then it's going to be difficult. But I, these kinds of things, they try to they try to make it where you don't have to do too much. It's just kind of a little bit of change you have to make to your to your app code. And I guess it would really affect apps more that have done things um, to like little kind of workarounds and tricks to run in the background or do things like you know how PaySpot has that thing that it does where if you open it and you tell it to stay on, it'll stay on for ten minutes in the background. And then it'll, you know, it'll go off and come back on if you relaunch it. Like, there's things like that, I guess, that may affect it. And again, I'm, I haven't looked at the APIs in detail, so I'm not speaking, you know, factually. But I guess depending on how you've written the app code itself, it could either be super easy and a couple lines you drop in, or it could be a real pain in the butt. I kind of... For for me, it kind of like when people started talking about Retina Display and did exactly what Seth said before. Immediately, people started talking about who didn't have it and they were angry that the apps hadn't updated or they wouldn't buy an app that didn't have Retina Display. And I don't know if, because Retina Display kind of hurts your eyes. Like, oh, look, fuzzy graphics. Ow, ow, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. But I don't know if Backup and Restore will be like, ah, oh, there's no Backup and Restore. Oh, I can't feel my legs. I think it's it's going to be one of those things that for power users of apps that need to do restores more frequently, I think that's really going to be a big deal. But a lot of these apps where you basically just have a, a login, like a Twitter app, where you just ha- you put your login back in and your, your data is there, unless you're really saving stuff within the app, which in a lot of apps it, it, it isn't really an issue, I can't see how it's going to be that big of a deal. But there's stuff like um, like podcast apps, for instance, like Instacast. If I have 15 podcasts in my Instacast queue and I'm not backing that up, that means that when I do a restore, I not only have to put my uh, OPML in from Dropbox, like re-import that, but then it's going to start pulling all the feeds again and then it's going to start downloading again. Whereas if I have it all backed up through iCloud, yeah, it would be a large backup because of the, the data that's within, you know, cache within the app. But all of that stuff would come back the way it was. And there's other, there's many other apps that do that. Even apps like there's a Fios uh, DVR app that has a really annoying setup process for how you have to connect it to your set-top box and stuff like that. And every time I restore, I have to go through it again, and it's annoying. It would be great to not have to do that, and iCloud to just kind of whip it back on there with all those things in place. 
Well, we even had had an issue actually with Twitter because they only saved. We did a contest for Twitter, remember, Renee? Yeah. And we had a lot of people that sent in um, Twitter pics to us, and then after a few days, Twitter just kind of got randomly got rid of. Uh, the pictures, so we actually had to go back to everyone and say, listen, sorry if we lost your photo. Twitter, you know, we hate Twitter. Here we go. <laughs> we'll go through. <laughs> Twitter didn't care. They didn't write to us and say, we're going to help you out. And yeah, we lost a whole bunch of pictures for it. So it would have been nice, actually, if we could have, you know, chosen to, you know, upload down to iCloud at a certain date and time state and then been able to have it and not have to worry. Well, the thing that the thing that kills me is that, and I think this this actually wouldn't solve that, Georgia, because, and I don't think it'll solve your podcast problem either, Seth, because you only get five gigs of of backup space, and uh, people are finding already with PhotoStream that they take a few movies, and PhotoStream starts telling them they've run out of iCloud space, and yes, you can buy more, but I don't know how many people want to buy more, and certainly, you know, podcasts, large files like that are going to just, video files, what have you, are going to kill any any backup space we have. So I'm not sure Apple's really giving us a good solution for that yet. Renee, do you think that we're going to have the options of things that we want to sync down to iCloud as separate applications? Um, or is it going to, you know, if we're, you know, hooked into iCloud, we're going to have to sync either everything and or nothing? Because there's certain things that I would love to sync to iCloud. There's certain things that I definitely don't just because, like, I wouldn't even be able to fi- sync, say, it allowed for photos or for video. It, there would just be no chance for me. Um and there's certain apps that I would love to have synced and backed up in other applications, of which I wouldn't. And some just take up way too much space anyways. Seth told me that this was possible. I did not believe him because my iCloud just wouldn't work forever. And now it's working, and I believe he's correct. Yeah, you can actually toggle which apps you want to sync and back up on, a, on an app-by-app basis in your settings. So you will be able to do that. Okay, great. But still, I think that I'm, I just, I'll probably go way through it way too quickly. Yeah, I agree. Well, it depends. You take a lot of movies? Yeah. 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 So PhotoStream might eat it up. And th- again, it's because they say that PhotoStream doesn't count against your five gigs, but it looks like it is right now. Or did they not say that? I thought they said if PhotoStream didn't count against your five gigs. I thought that's what they said, but I mean, everything's in beta right now so yeah. it's entirely possible that it doesn't and it's just reading that it does the rumors that seth and i have heard on the internet about these things were not specific and we have no direct knowledge that's right yeah the fun part about being in beta yes real beta not google beta <laughs> right so let's go back to a uh, girl's bikinis and tablets what yes what <laughs> Verizon has aired its own iPad 2 commercial. It seemed like Peter Coyote did not do it for them. And so they went straight to it. This uh, just, uh, you know, bleeds the uh, seven inch um, Kindle. Hold on, are you ready? Yes, please do it. Oh my gosh. I'm excited. Hit it. It's It's faster, faster, thinner, thinner, and and lighter. And with with the the power power of Verizon, you can can stay stay connected connected almost anywhere. anywhere. Let's say you want to download a bestseller at the beach. Done. Or if you want to stay connected when you're miles away from Wi-Fi. No problem. You can even tweet when you're nowhere near your followers. And you can post pictures too. So what do you think? I'll take it. The iPad 2, America's largest and most reliable network. Verizon. What do you... What do you think? Pretty sweet. Yeah, no pretty sweet. Us actually being able to yeah. play it inside. Um, the actual video itself, Seth, did it do it for you? Um, do it. What do you do? Do it. You you said there were going to be bikinis, and I didn't see any, so no, I didn't. <laughs> well, do she it was wearing me. a shirt, bikini. The shirt was kind of over the bikini. I apologize for that, Seth. That might have been a little bit not as magical as it could have been. Yeah, over and the shirt, yeah. bikini is much actually, better than under the shirt. Actually, what happened to the bikini? sex selling an iPad? I don't know. It, yeah, it was a it was a cool commercial. I, I, I that's is that the first Verizon one that we've seen? No, they had another one a while back, but it was for the Verizon iPad plus MiFi combo of the early days before they had a CDMA iPad, and it blew right. it blew the guy's house down. You know what I've noticed is that a lot of the Apple commercials themselves 
feature of Verizon branding at the end, but I haven't seen one with AT&T in a while either. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that could just be the times I'm watching TV, so it could mean absolutely nothing, but that's been my experience is that I see that a lot more. Besides that I got Verizon iPad and you can use it, I don't think there was anything really memorable um, about the commercial. Nothing. Well, they there. used the seminal 80s hit, I Want Candy. That's, <laughs> that's memorable. The chat room is saying... You know, I don't even think that the music was exceptionally memorable, though. It didn't actually give me... The nice thing about the Apple commercials is that they elicit an emotion in me. I actually feel more connected to my iPad, which is, I think, what Apple is trying to go for, that it can make my life happier, more relaxed, how I can use it, how it can make things better for me. Um, Even in the... uh, like a Kindle commercial where you can use it in a certain way that you cannot use the iPad. I get that. It kind of... Its branding comes through. This commercial is relatively unmemorable. Yeah, maybe the bikini would have helped out a little bit more. Well, the commercial, I mean, it's showing you the apps, right? So it's very much like an Android tablet commercial in that it's like... But does, These it, actually things- sh- does it show any of the apps that were memorable in comparison to the last Learn? Uh, the no. last Learn Apple commercial, well, actually, people were asking, what are those applications? Yeah, I don't even and they, for this they even one. have a category in the App Store for apps you've seen on TV. But the Verizon commercial is just basically pushing the 3G. Like, oh, you're not at home in your Wi-Fi network? Right. Well, all the right. things you want to do at home, you can do other places too. So it was really more focused on the mobility of it as, as opposed to the emotional connections that the other commercials make. But those really, really impressive apps. So here's my right, question. Right, and I did get the 3G thing, that's true. Would it make you switch to Verizon? Because the whole thing is Apple's selling 20, 20 million iPads, so they don't need help selling iPads. Verizon wants your business, and they, they're going to try to convince you that they have good eVideo Rev A coverage uh, if you get your iPad with them. Uh, truthfully, I would consider it with the iPad way more than I would with the phone, only because I'm kind of, I'm kind of dug in with the phone, but... The thing about, you know, right now not having simultaneous voice and data really wouldn't be a problem for me on the iPad. So I have, an, I have an AT&T 3G iPad. I would consider a Verizon one, like if that was the only one that was available or if somebody, you know, talked to me one day and convinced me. I would, I would probably do it because I wouldn't rely on it in quite the same way. And it's really the, the 3G on my iPad is a matter of convenience. Like I really do when I go. <laughs> When we go to the beach and I'm not actually surfing, I will sit on the beach with my iPad like a giant nerd and and read things and do things. And I'm like, wow, this is great, like 3G. But so it doesn't matter to me whose 3G it is. I would I would definitely consider it. I hope you have like an over an uh, overboard or an aquapack case then for your iPad if you're if you're going to be on the beach with it, um, if not for the water and salt and sand. I uh, I, I take care of it. Don't worry. I would. It's all um, right. I, was that a little too mothering for you, Seth? No, it's I, it's I, okay. I appreciate that you care. Good, good. Um, no, I I don't know if I would. I think that it would have been a more effective commercial to just you know have one person you know with better coverage than the other commer- you know straight up against AT and T so that people get that because I'm not sure if I actually picked up upon that on I mean, its if own. The, if the kid in the restaurant was having a fit because he couldn't download his YouTube video on AT and T. But instead of disciplining him, the parents just gave him a CDMA iPad instead. I thought they just shoved a Big Mac in their mouth, no? (laughs) Take a Big Mac and an iPad and shut the hell up, kid. Right, exactly. Jello pudding, kid. You got got ketchup on my iPad. I'm going to be upset. (laughs) Last week, we spoke about charitable donations and how Apple really has been kind of dropped the ball on, you know, giving down to charities. Well, Tim Cook must have been listening. Listening to you or listening to us? Who's he listening to? Listening to Pete. I would love to hear that he was listening to us, but probably not. But he has decided to bring, um, yeah, Apple to have a matching program for their uh, people. Can I say uh, U.S. Said? Yeah, please. Team, I'm very happy to announce that we are kicking (laughs) off a match and gift program for charitable donations. We are really inspired by the generosity of our coworkers who give back to the community. And this program is going to help that individual given go even further. Now, here's the key part. 
Starting September 15th, when you give money to a nonprofit 501 bracket C bracket bracket 3 bracket organization, Apple will match you gift dollar for dollar up to $10,000 annually. This program will be for full-time employees in the U.S. at first, and we will expand to other parts of the world over time. And then basically at the very end, he says, if you'd like more information on this program, you can get it on HR Web, which can be easily accessed through Apple Web, which I guess are secret sites that we're not allowed on as you know, the general public. Is that your Tim Cook impression? No, it's more <coughs> generic Southern. It's, Tim Cook is far more stately than that. Where is he from? Um, somewhere in the, isn't he somewhere, somewhere, I don't know. Where is he from? Texas, maybe? Let's see. He's got a biography somewhere. Because you definitely were, you were sliding a little bit south on that one. Let's let's take a, a little look. bit of twang. Does the chat room know where he's from? <laughs> yeah, Gareth in the chat room says, "Is it 10k per employee or in total?" Per employee, which man. I would hope would be per employee, because if it was in total, yeah, no, it's per that employee. That would be like really bad. I just yeah, said it's, in a very bad per, accent that it's per employee. It's per employee for one year, right? 10 10k annually per employee. He was born in Robertsdale, Alabama, so I'm claiming that. All I'm close. right, I'll give it to you then. Nice. Score! Now, do you think that that's enough? Like, do you think that, that like, because, I don't know. Eh? Well, it's coming I, enough. I, th- I think it's okay. 10,000 per 10,000 employees. How many employees do they have? 10,000 in, in corporate? 20,000 in, I don't know. They have tons of employees. That's, that could be a good, I mean, it's not, it's not 70 billion worth of money, but it's a good start. This well, isn't, what, uh, what do other companies do? Do we have any any idea, any kind of barometer as to what other corporations at Apple's level or close to Apple's level do in terms of matching? Bill Gates well, buys mosquitoes. Bill Gates buys like he's <laughs> he, he himself. Now this is a Microsoft though, but he he himself is given you know what billions. So you can't really kind of go into that. But Apple was at the bottom when they. I went through you know large companies that give away. Apple was at the bottom of the list. Well, that's the interesting thing about this is it's clearly the post-Jobs era because Steve Jobs was concerned about shades of white, roundness of corners, fit, finish, feel, the delight and magic of software. And, you know, he wasn't against charity per se because he apparently made anonymous donations to organ transplant and did other things like that. But um, he didn't make it an Apple priority because it wasn't his priority. And now Tim Cook is doing something kind of different. I'm going to gently challenge that. Do you think that this could possibly be something that they had considered doing maybe even just a few months ago and decided, you know what, let's wait and let this be one of the first things that Tim does? Not that that would be a bad thing because it's good either way, but just the timing of it made me think. I I will challenge your challenge to say that that Steve is ill. And uh, looking back upon his legacy and having to leave the company, if it is something else that he can do to help his legacy, I would say that at his stage of life, Tim Cook has plenty of time and Steve would be like, you know what, if this was his idea, he would want to run with it. Steve is many things wonderful, but I don't see, like when he has done something that he thinks is amazing, he takes account of that. Okay, counter challenge. Ready? Ready? Ready. Steve wants what's best for Apple, and what he what he knows is best for Apple right now is that Tim succeeds in the short term and long term. So even if it was his idea, I think he might have said, "You know what? This is your thing. You run with this after I'm out." You know. Okay. I, I think. That Can I make you- one more point? Yes. If Steve really did care about charities and donations in any way, shape, or form, he probably would have started before now. So, we so had, the fact that he hasn't yet, I would assume, would be the best call that he doesn't really, it's not really his thing, and it might be more Tim's thing. I, I have definitive okay. proof. Maybe. I, I can prove this one way or another. Oh, settle okay. it. First, we had Bono <laughs> come out, and Bono said, top of the morning to you. Sure, and shooting Steve, Steve Jobs to give money to charity. He's just not all up in your grid about it. He just he just throws it, you know, on the slide. There's a whole pot of, I mean, he, so we have Bono's word He's not the it. lucky charms leprechaun, Renee. <laughs> That are magically delicious. Um, <laughs> but the, the actual proof is that if this was a Steve Jobs letter, he would have said, you're accusing me of not giving charitable donations? You want charitable donations? Fine. Here are your charitable donations and some extra bumpers. And the wording was really <laughs> different than that. I still think it's strategic. I don't think they do anything in a oh, flippant manner. Oh, I think manner. it's strategic. 
I'm sure it's strategic. I think that Tim Cook, because it's been in the news lately about Apple not giving to charities and, you know, Bill own, owning half of the world uh, in charity, um, that he actually thought, yeah, you know what? Listen, I'm heading Apple. This is one area where we are weak and it'll look great for me. Let's do it. So I do. I absolutely agree with the strategy. I just I think that it might be more Tim than Steve. Okay. All right. Now go to your separate corners. Get ready for round two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's uh let's go at our other usual debate. Oh Flash. boy, here we go. Flash ah. <laughs> Adobe announces Flash Media. Yep. So um can we officially call this story Adobe Caves? Adobe Blinks. Adobe says uncle. Is that fair? Seth Clifford? No. Yeah, um it's it's kind of fair, and the 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 unsaid part of this story from most people is that it's it's not really furthering a, a, an agenda that's going to work in the long term because ultimately what's going to happen is people are still going to be making flash videos and they're oh. going to get sidelined and pushed through the transcoder for iOS devices, but. Basically, other machines that don't have Flash are not going to be seen and, and receive the HTML. So like, let's say, say you have a MacBook with no, no Flash on it. I have two of those. If, if you don't have your user agent set to mobile Safari, you're not going to get the HTML5 either. You're going to get nothing. So Adobe is kind of doing a cut your nose to spite your face move with this, I think. So it's, it's acquiescing a little bit like, okay, we get it. iOS is not going to run Flash, so we've got this thing. But it's also not really thinking through all the possible permutations of what that decision means. So let's just, just to clarify. So before Renee, can you go- tell us what exactly this does? Yes. Yeah, so- Do I get my Flash? Right away, people started saying, Flash on iOS, Flash on iOS. And to quote Phil Nickinson, no, stop it. You are not getting Flash on iOS. What Adobe is now doing at the end of 2011 is what Microsoft did at the end of 2009. Yes, even Microsoft is way ahead of Flash on this one. They are, they are making a product that sits on the server. And when it sends you the Flash video, if it, dis- if it discovers that you have an iOS device... Um, and the broadcaster has enabled the functionality, it will send you an, an, an HTML5 video instead. So it's basically knocking on the door. You're saying, none of your propaganda. And they're going, okay, but then we have this. And to Seth's point, it would be nicer if it did it the other way around, if it only sent HTML video. And then if you're running Internet Explorer, no, even they support it. If you're running Firefox or Chrome, it would fall back on Flash. Um, so it's just for video. It's not for your games. It's not for your user interfaces. It's not for anything fancy. It's just the person who's broadcasting the video, like we're doing now with Ustream, can choose to broadcast both Flash and HTML5 video. And if it detects iOS, it will play the HTML5. So are yeah. you happy, Georgia? Are you happy now? Look what you made Adobe do. You have a small (laughs) chance of eventually getting video that's not Flash because the important thing to remember too is the big broadcasters don't don't adopt new versions of the software. And they're not gonna they're not gonna update so that I won't get this. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like Hulu is not gonna do this for you. No, but she's in Canada, so they won't do it for her anyway. So I yeah, Hulu already doesn't do it for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was mean. That was mean, Seth. Which is actually when we get to the Google story, I'm gonna laugh about that too. (laughs) <laughs> well let's let's since you know i i'll i'll just suffice to the uh flash sadness there but um i did get a little excited for a moment why so uh well because i i saw the word flash but anyways let's talk about injunctions injunction the- junction what's your function sorry <laughs> now I'm going to have that in my head all night. Thank you. You're welcome. From childhood. Apple's adjunction against the Galaxy tab has been upheld in Germany. I'm really, really shocked by this. That, you know, that they've actually taken a look that people are now going to have to visually differentiate their tablets, perhaps. Is this going to scare people that have other tablet designs that look a lot like the iPad? Yes. I'm saying yes. 
Well, the judge was even more specific. He said, like, to paraphrase, are you telling me that only the way that Apple made a tablet, that's the only way you can think of making a tablet? There's not a single creative bone in your body that could come up with an idea that I'm going way off script here. That come up with a single idea that's different than Apple. Microsoft had handles on their tablets for Chris' sakes. You didn't copy them, did you? I um, did chuckle when you said the, the handles. Well, I mean, uh, I, it's, there's two sides to this. One is there's this really famous lawsuit that was Lotus uh, Notes versus Lotus One Two Three versus Excel, where the judge ruled that. Once you come up with the most logical way of doing something, it's not really copying. It's just other people doing the most logical way of doing this. And so this judge is saying that maybe what Apple's done with the iPad isn't the, like, you know, Plutokian, Plutokian, Plutokian? how do you pronounce that, Georgia? Plutokian form tablet. Maybe there are other interpretations of a tablet, and he would like to see other companies maybe not copying Apple so much. <sighs> Okay, but then couldn't this then just open up a whole bunch of lawsuits? Because there's a whole bunch of phones that look exactly like the iPhone. They didn't even start off looking like the iPhone, yet they look like the iPhone now, which is much clearer distinction of copying than someone copying something that's already out and popular. Seth? Yeah. Uh, short answer, yeah, it can open up all kinds of litigation that we probably have been standing right on the edge of and now possibly are going to see. But it's... Like, b besides have like, it has to be, it's a tablet, right? Like, by design, it's going to have to be flat. It yeah. has to be light enough to be held. Like, maybe if you make something round, but then how are the designers going to design oh, their applications? I want a round tablet. Well, I, I'm all for working hard and protecting what you've built, but I'm, I'm kind of unsure about how I feel about this and I'm leaning toward this probably isn't a great decision because I know that Apple gets cranky when people directly copy their design and Samsung has done really almost dopey things like the, the cable that comes with it looks exactly like an iPhone cable, like the shape of it and the width and everything. It's just black. You mean the 32-pin so dock? Right, exactly. So, like, okay, you pull it out and you're enough. like, whoa. You know, so there's there's things that Samsung has done that are so closely, you know, they're so close to that, like, really inappropriate step. And then there's stuff, like you said, like, a tablet is a tablet. Like, it's going to be a certain thickness, a certain size, and there's going to be stuff on the screen. So, you know, where do you where do you draw the line? Where's, where's what's copying and what's, you know, what's the standard tablet like cars all have for the most part four wheels and a chassis and windows that you can look out of so you know are we at that point where the 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 iPad standard has become the the tablet and people build off of that and it's it's not something that you can sue against or in the case of Samsung are they skirting so closely you know to really you know not just copying the idea but copying the exact things that go along with it, that could, you know, in the words of the lawsuit stuff, confuse consumers like the cable. So it's it's tough, you but obviously, to you, Seth? well, this was a Samsung screen that was captured by Dr. Mackenstein, um, and he's wondering the thing in the center is it supposed to look like an Apple logo or not? Well, that depends who you ask, I guess. Right? I mean that. To, to an Apple person, yeah, I guess. It sort of looks like a close-cropped Apple logo. But in all the universes, it really have to look like that? Right, exactly. It's, it's choices. They're making really questionable choices. So instead of, instead of kind of just taking the ideas and going with the ideas and saying, this is, this is what everyone is doing and this is how it is, they're almost like poking the bear, so to speak, because they're doing things like that, doing things like the cable that... It's it's as close as they can get and get away with it, you know. And and the a lot of people say that the what is the Samsung skin that they put on it? The um, Touch Wiz. Touch Wiz, right? They're saying that that stuff. You know, the first time I picked up a Captivate, I flipped around on it and I was like, wow, this is really iPhone like. They got the kind of bouncy, you know, at the top of the, the top and bottom of the lists and things like that. And the icons were all kind of uniform in size because they've. They've edged them off nicely, whereas other Android phones, you know, the icons are all kinds of different shapes and things like that. It was very much an iPhone-ish experience. And so Samsung has been treading this line very closely. So it's not surprising that Apple barked at them, but 
we're getting to a point now where it's hard to distinguish what's the standard and what is Apple's stuff specifically. And Florian Mueller added that um, the injunction doesn't really just say uh, touchpad, uh, sorry, um, Galaxy Tab 10.1. This could theoretically apply or be extended to all touch to all Galaxy Tab products. Well, the right. the weird thing for me is that I would think that Samsung could say, "Well, listen, this is the only thing that's out there, so and because it works, we you know there's no other you know way that we've started." Whereas com- in comparison with the iPhone, everyone had phones that were completely different. The iPhone came out; it was the only one of its kind, and then all of the phones now look quite iPhone-like. It seems to have a much stronger case for the iPhone in versus the iPad, which. You know, it was the only one there that is kind of, you know, the first time that someone makes something that sounds like the blues, well, then everyone else copies them. There was no other blues before that. It kind of makes sense Here's to me. Here's my question, though, because what's the most successful tablet right now? The iPad. The second most successful tablet, arguably, and it's not even a real tablet, is the Amazon Kindle. The first Kindle. iPad? No, well, yeah. no the, <laughs> the Amazon original Kindle iPad? is the only other device. It's not even a tablet, but it's the only other arguably successful device in this space. And it doesn't look anything like an iPad, doesn't work anything like an iPad. And I'm guessing the Amazon tablet is going to be quite differentiated from an iPad, and it's going to be more successful than all the iPad wannabes. So I might even suggest that as much as Samsung gains by deliberately trying to look and feel like an iPad, they might gain more by coming up with something different that people would get instead of an iPad, instead of looking at it like just a second-rate iPad. Right. Well, Cyber Sam in the chat room says that the Kindle doesn't even, you would not even consider it a tablet because it's really just an e-reader. Now, but it won't be soon. It won't be soon, but who knows how many that will sell. Yeah, I'm guessing it'll sell. I would assume it's going to sell very well, but again, that is just by assumption. Uh, The Galaxy Tab is quite popular. It's quite, you know, nice looking. Its interface is great, but this is a huge blow. If Apple loses, they will have to end up, you know, paying a certain amount of money towards what they believe that they would have sold. I would assume a percentage of that. But no matter what, it's going to be a huge hit. And I think that Apple has, it's a huge win for Apple because now every other person that's coming out to design a tablet is going to think twice about the manner in which uh, they're copying of any company, not even Apple. But it's important to remember, too, that if this is a bit of a gamble for Apple because if this is overturned, they would owe damages to Samsung for lost sales. Now, we could be facetious yeah. and laugh and say, what lost sales, right? But Well, the, the thing is, <laughs> yeah. even, if they, even if they do pay the money, like they're deciding to go at it, which is already just paying their legal fees is a lot of money. So they don't mind. I don't think they care about paying for a little bit of lost sales as long as, you know, if two people get injured, if, if two people lose the exact same amount of money and one person has just a ton more money, they can go in it to win it just to cause strife, stress, and difficulty in having Samsung go forward. So right now, they've pretty much halted Samsung in their steps in this one main. It's just Germany, but you know it is definitely a, you know if it stands as it is, it's going to be a call out to everyone else. So Samsung can't think about developing, say, their next tablet because they have to think about, hmm, we have to design it to look something that looks a little different. A contingency plan. And so it stops them. It's cost them a lot more money than just selling uh, Galaxy tabs. Now, Georgia, uh, just for the record, were you invoking Loki or Cyric in that little strife, tyranny, and lies uh, speech? <laughs> can, can you invoke both at the same time? Do yes. they then come out and fight? Uh, no, but yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question. <laughs> for another time. Yes. So I guess these pa- these uh, patent, you know, everyone fighting over patents and everything else, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it's it's a you hold enough game. patents, you hold enough patents, and you can say I'm not going to fight. It's it's almost like um, you know Russia, U.S. getting a whole bunch of nukes. They're just holding each other at bay. You have enough patents against someone else, and you can bring each other to say um, a standstill with loss of money in legal fees. 
well, here's, people might back off. Here's the interesting question, because um, also in news this week, HTC filed another countersuit against... So Apple is suing HTC as well. They're not just suing Samsung. And HTC previously filed a countersuit. And now they've added some more patents to it. And it turns out they got these patents from Google a week ago, who bought them from Motorola and Palm, just to kind of... and then. I don't know, sold them, gave them, we don't know, to HTC. And HTC's statement was kind of odd because they said that basically they would defend their inventions where, you know, you could argue that Apple bought um, finger, uh, what was that? finger works, you know, multi-touch patents, but they've expanded on them since then. Maybe they'll get LTE patents from Nortel. But a, a, a truckload of Apple patents have Stephen, Stephen Jobs' name on them. And HTC is talking about inventing, to protecting their inventions, which were given or sold to them by Google a week ago, and doesn't feel like an invention to me. I know that's kind of petty, but it just feels different. Yeah, well, this, you know, the whole, the whole patent borrowing thing feels weird in and of itself to me. So the, the idea that deals aren't even closed yet and people are sharing patents to make things happen, I, that... that that by itself just doesn't sit right. So, I, I don't know. Georgia, what, <laughs> what are you laughing at? Hold on, I'm going full screen on Georgia. Yeah, do that. She's, she's stuck in the chat room, and she's, now she's covering her eyes. We're still here. Hold on, full screen. <laughs> now I'm putting your name there just so people can see that it's her laughing. <laughs> Oh, okay. sorry. All right, let's. let's I apologize. Break. All right. Are you back with us? You, you promised I'm that you'd pay attention this week. I, I am. I'm sorry. No, and now no, I'm not, not even to the chat room late. to us. I, <laughs> I can't even. Yeah. Let's Please, let's just move on. We're, we're waiting for you. We don't have the script. <laughs> well, let's, let's go through. Let's go away from patents and deal with some apps. Um, we have, of course, Ali, uh, Liana has done the picks of the week for September 10th on. And Seth, you gave up life for iPad. I did, yeah. I, um, I was really happy to find this. I stumbled onto it in the App Store one day. It's a really great iPad app that allows you to see some of the, the, uh, the excellent photography that Life Magazine has put out over the years. And my very favorite stuff is... The really, really old stuff, especially of New York from the 30s and 40s and 50s, just amazing black and white photography that just completely transports you back to another time. And the captions and the descriptions are excellent. And it just, it's, it's not the, the most beautiful app. It's not the, the greatest thing you'll ever do. But if you're a photography fan and you like history and you like that kind of stuff, I found myself just sitting on the couch completely immersed in it, just enjoying, enjoying it. And Renee, you also did one password, which we've spoken about a lot, but I don't know if a lot of people have actually um, taken a look at it. Can you explain what exactly one First password all, does for you? This isn't just one password. This is one password for the Mac App Store. So one password, you can get it on iPhone and iPad. It's a universal app. It works great. Previously, it was, a, it was a Mac app, but now you can go to the Mac App Store, get it. You pay once. It goes on all your Macs. It's 20 bucks, half price right now, and comes with a free upgrade to 1Password 4 so that people who are concerned about buying it again, um, you know, they're, they get a little reward for getting on the train. And the reason I like it, and I know that Seth Clifford shares this exact same reason with me, is that when I have to reinstall uh, a Mac, I basically turn on that new Mac or that freshly installed Mac, I enter my Apple ID, I download Dropbox, that has my 1Password library, then I install 1Password, and I can gain access to any website to do anything. My installation is 90% done at that point. Yep. You want to know something? I had not installed Lion prior to Friday because we're all Snow Leopard in the office and I've got to maintain everything and I'm just not ready for it. This app is so good and I love it so much and I love everyone who works on it so much that I upgraded to Lion and bought it because I had to have it. <laughs> nice. Because it usually, wow. like, the thing that's, that's funny is that usually you have this war between convenience and security, that the more convenient your password is, the less secure it is. And if you make it too complicated, people start writing it down as even less secure. But one password will generate these gnarly pseudo-random passwords for you, remember them, and then automatically fill them so that you don't have to do the heavy lifting. It does all that for you. 
Um, and it's just it's and Seth and I had the with and Mark Edwards had the privilege of interviewing Dan Patterson, the graphic designer on Iterate, and he was telling us what's coming in one password. We just got a little hint of it here, so I want to see what they have in store for us for four. It's an amazing app. It'll change your life as yeah. a computer user. It really will. I agree. And also from Liana, Apple has pulled the print to PDF from the App Store. Okay, pass it, Renee. Uh, see, that's interesting because they used an undocumented API. So basically, they were using AirPrint in a way that Apple specifically does not allow you to use AirPrint, and they were printing to a PDF printer that would generate the PDF. Um, so Apple approved it initially, but then, as sometimes happens, they discovered this later. And I don't know why their automatic tool, they're supposed to have a tool that sniffs for, um, on a, for private API use, but it, or maybe it's just, maybe it wasn't a private API, but it was a, an out of bounds API issue. Um, so they removed it. And we've heard some conjecture that there's a security concern there because people could use it to do something malicious. Uh, not this app, but in general. So that's why, so that, and that's why Apple cares so much about people using private APIs because of the insecurity of that. So, well, it's a lack of dependability because uh, Apple is when Apple says an API is public, it will be there for generations of that product to come, and they will very deliberately and methodically deprecate it and tell you when it's going away. But private APIs are private because they could change it between beta builds, between releases, between patches. It could change, especially now with the bit diff updates, the, um, the Delta file updates in iOS 5, they could push out a small packet that would change it and break this app and then they'll get, everyone will get a huge amount of complaints because they bought an app that doesn't work. Well, Seth, what I want to know is that, is Apple doing, do you think that this is a valid point for Apple to be so difficult on people using, um, you know, unverified, unacceptable APIs, or are they just being a little bit overly controlling? Because that's kind of the way that most people that I discuss this with kind of see that Apple's getting going a little bit overboard and being a little bit overly constructive. And then there's the other side of saying, well, no, Apple's actually trying to make sure that the user experience is just really stable. I, I think you could definitely see it from both ways. Uh, as, as someone who would design software, I think you could definitely see it as, you know, these things are there. They're private, but they exist. We should be able to use them. And Apple's just being a baby and not letting us, you know, hit all these APIs that we want. But Apple's goal and their entire focus is on the consumer and the end user and their experience, which is why so many of the decisions that they make incur the wrath of so many nerds. So it's not what we want. It's what most people need that we're going to get. And so their protection of their private APIs just completely goes along with that because they don't want users to experience apps that may run really great one day. And then all of a sudden, if Apple flips a switch and turns off an API, that app falls apart. And, and that, that kind of experience, that disappointment, that frustration, they want to avoid that as much as possible, which is why you have sandboxing on iOS, which is why you have crazy app store submissions and approvals. I mean, it's been getting better over the past couple of years. So even that's, uh, you know, it's a learning process for them. All of the things they do are to make end users lives with their products better and easier. So private APIs are just a part of that. They just say, listen, these things are here because we may use them and we think they're a good idea, but you're not allowed to touch them yet. It's, it's, it's not ready yet. When we decide to make them public and we think they're stable and we're going to keep supporting them for however long we're going to do it, we will let you know. And at that point, you can jump all over it. But it's all about the end user and that experience. So it's definitely, that's, that's their concern. You know, you just sounded exactly like Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse where he's like, be nice. Until when? Be nice. Until when? Until I tell you not to be nice. And then I just did a roundhouse kick. It's not as though uh, Apple, though, this is not a secret thing where your app has just been taken out of the App Store and no one knew. And it's not as if when they were designing an application that they didn't know beforehand that this is the manner in which Apple wanted to. Uh, the, the, this wasn't a secret handling of Apple's way. It's already out there. You know, you use their, the APIs that are approved or your app could be pulled. And so it's kind of like if you choose to walk uh, 
you walk on the dark side and you get caught. Just to to be careful with this one, it wasn't a private API. They are using an API in a manner that wasn't approved. The API for AirPrint is fine, but Apple did not intend for people to use it the way that this company was using it. (laughs) Okay, so then then I'm still a little bit kind of remarks that, you know, how does... Would they know beforehand that this is a manner in which Apple did not intend for you to use it? I'm not sure, but I have a big hunk and suspicion that Apple is going to quickly patch this so that you can't use it like that. Because things like this, like when you can start using an API for things that Apple doesn't mean and start printing, I don't know if there is a security implication to this, but it it just sounds like, it seems like something to me that uh, Apple is going to patch quickly and then the app would stop working. You see, now it kind of makes me go back to Apple kind of being a little bit controlling. Well, it's kind of like, you know, Steve Jobs said this in the D8 conference. He goes like, we're not perfect. We're trying to find our way through here. So we denied a certain kind of app and then we we ended up blocking a political cartoonist. So we changed the rules. So they're, they're learning. Like they have this huge app store and they're not afraid to say we're learning as we're doing this. And they might decide, oh, okay, we shouldn't have pulled this app and they'll put it back. Or they'll say, oh, we shouldn't have approved this app because if someone does this, they can do this and this and that's bad. So we better patch this and get that app out of there. So, I mean... I doubt we'll have Tim Cook, you know, in telling Walt Mossberg what's going on anytime soon, but I have a feeling it's one of those, you know, unforeseen circumstances, app rejections. I'm not sure I understand what people get so upset about, though. It's a private API for a reason. You stick to the public API. Think. But it wasn't a private API. It was public and then they made it private? No, it was a public no, API. No, it was that they, they used a public yeah. API in a manner in which Apple does not approve of. Uh, or they didn't ex- anticipate. They're using the AirPrint they API to print to a PDF on the device instead of printing to a printer, which it's supposed to be used for. Mm. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I can see it. I can see it the other way, too, that it's it's a little heavy-handed. A little bit. Just a little. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, well, okay, now that we fixed it, we didn't make, mean it. You can, now you can release it, and it's, it's already too late because we can't use it that manner. Let's, let's go to uh, arcade games. Yeah, you've been waiting for this, I can tell. I have, I have. Atari is to set to release its own joystick base for the iPad, which is so cool because we were talking about wanting to do the little tiny um, arcade box for the iPad. iCade. Icade. So we should definitely pick one up and go head to head to see if the Icade is better or the Atari Arcade. And oh, Hal, it is we'll... on like King of Kong. Plus, plus <laughs> Hal, I'll take my I'll take my my uh, large arcade machine and we'll put them all three head to head because I have Atari on all of them. Tippy TV, let's do it. Okay. Arcade versus arcade versus arcade. Because it is the one thing that I have to say is uh, with my own arcade machine is that uh, it's hard to play Cubert on. So It is on like Donkey Kong. Yeah. Do you play Do you play like old Atari games, Seth? Did you ever play any of them? Oh, do I play old Atari games? You know, I'm going to take pictures of my basement and send them to you. My basement is a museum of classic video games. I got a 2600 and about 50 cartridges down there, and that's that's the tip of the iceberg. So, <laughs> awesome. yes. Okay, well, well, when you come on down, you can take a look at our arcade machine and uh and see it up. Cuz yeah, I'm all over this for sure. We also have the daily tip of the day, how to buy the Google eBooks on the iPhone or the iPad, which is very cool. So take a look at that. And we also have our contest win- winners. We have been running contests like no one else's business. And now we also have an easy manner in which to access them. So come take a look. Uh, we have winners for the Jabber Drive, the book book, iWork for iOS, and MoneyWiz. We do. And you can go to tippy.com slash contests and you can see them all you can enter them all you can maybe even georgia dare i say it win them all you could and those uh nasdaq speakers yeah awesome want awesome there's a whole me wants me wants for sure we have like contests coming like yeah i'm not gonna say it but we just have a lot of contests so come take a peek and look and enter because if you don't enter you can't seth then you can't yep. win. Nah, you can't win. He fights for the users, but in order to fight, you have to be part of the game. Yeah. Place your quarters in. Flynn's. I think that is about it for today, Renee. Whew, we actually made it. Seth? Yeah, we, we did. We barely scraped it out. 
Nice. <laughs> we did. So I would like to say thank you so much for Seth Clifford for joining us today. Thank you, Georgia. Pleasure as always. And how can we find you, Seth? Seth Clifford on Twitter, on the Tippy Shows, iPhone and iPad Live, on uh, Iterate with Renee and Mark Edwards of Django. And if you'd like to see some of our work, we're Nickelfish. Our website is NF- I- <laughs> nfidm.com. <laughs> Thank you. And Renee, thank you so much. Uh, you have been doing all of the video switching and getting all the sound and all of the other audio and video goodness to us. So thanks trying. for that. Oh, my pleasure. Hopefully we'll smooth this out and it'll be easy sailing from now on. Uh, it, I have to say it absolutely rocks. Just being able to watch the video during the show was super cool. Oh, nice. So nice. thank you for that. Oh, thank Marcus. He set all this up, man. He just sent it over to me to be the monkey behind the buttons. Super sweet. Everyone tell Marcus how much this really did rock because it did. And how do we find you, Renee? You can find me at Renee Ritchie on Twitter. You can find me at tippy.com and you can find me at zenintech.tv. Great. And on Google and Plus where I get plusy with it. <laughs> plus that. Plus Google Plus. And I'm Georgia. You can find me on Twitter at Georgia TIPB. You can find me on the blog, www.tippy.com, and also on Zen and Tech, which is coming right up, right, Renee? Yep, coming up next. Great. And you oh, can reach all. I'm sorry? sorry. I just need to make a shout out. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please. I promised. I promised I would do this. I missed Jay Baby's birthday. She's a Aww. she's a, a wonderful a wonderful human being and a friend of the show and, and a big an awesome help. Moderator. So, yes, I told her I would do that. I wanted to make sure I got it in. Sorry. Oh, sweet, super sweet. Actually, she was the first person in the first show that I did to say um, lie to me and tell me I did a good job. So nice. love her. <laughs> she can fake sincerity like nobody's business. Right. <laughs> I'm much sorry. Love. I interrupted. Love, Go ahead. No, way important, way important. They're more way important than this. So you can reach all of us at Tippy via email at podcast at tippy.com or leave a sh- comment when the show goes live. Please do. We're here every Sunday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, 2 a.m. British Summertime. And, of course, our companion show, Renee. iPhone Live. It is at the same bat time, same bat channel on Wednesday nights. www.tippy.com. And for all of our podcasts, including iPhone Live, iPad Live, Zen and Tech, Super Functional, It's a Rate, Android Central, Crackberry.com, and more, see mobilenations.com slash shows. If you haven't already, subscribe to all the shows on iTunes and leave a rating. It helps people find us and means a ton to us. Thank you to the Tippy iPad Accessory Store. That's where you can find all kinds of awesome, cool stuff. And if you want to find the carbon fiber backing that I have on my iPad right now, that's where you can find it. And they sponsor the podcast. So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for showing up live because, um, yeah, that's so super cool. So, um, and stick around. We have Zen and Tech coming right up. Darn it. That was the wrong one. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> that has to stay. And we have, um, we have, who do we have on Iterate this week? Is it Mark Jardine from Catbox, isn't it? Yeah. Tomorrow. We survived. Oh.